It would be funny if you just if we had like a whole conversation. You're like, oh no, I never hit record. Oh, listen, sister. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our retrospective dedicated to the films of Bela Lugosi, this time with Lugosi's mysterious performance in the 1932 Universal film Murders in the Rue Morgue. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it, so warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of the upcoming Young Captain Nemo, from Fievel and Friends, Macmillan books that's coming in march we are nearly there with me from austin is tony salvaggio tech director at rooster teeth lead singer and bassist of the band deserts of mars and lead guitarist of the band rise from fire say hello tony howdy howdy and also in austin writer of the long-running underground comic series halloween man winner of the 2018 best of austin award from austin chronicle the one and only mr drew edwards say hello also known as the bride of science the <laughs> bride of science so you're and worthy. he is he is indeed and finally also in denver as always color commentary from attorney julia guzman of guzman immigration of denver say hello joya <laughs> i'm definitely not worthy of being the bride of science <laughs> okay all right murders in the room morgue is a 1932 american pre-code and how horror film very loosely based on edgar Allan poe's short story the murders in the room morgue bela lugosi one year after his performance as dracula portrays a lunatic scientist who abducts women and does some funky stuff with their blood uh, to mix their blood with an ill-tempered cage ape uh, and it was the cinematographer was Carl Freund. Robert Flory was the director. It did not do well when it came out, but actually it looks quite beautiful. And uh, critics have noticed that the movie is not very long, uh, depending on the version you see. It'll it's uh, typically about an hour. So uh, it, as I said, very well regarded cult classic and we are approaching this as the second film in a collection of films looking at the career of Bela Lugosi. So that is Murders in the Rue Morgue. Let's get our opening thoughts. Uh, let's go Julia, Tony, the returning Drew, and then I'll go Julia, what are your opening thoughts for Murders in the Rue Morgue? Um, I, we saw this film and then we ended up not uh, talking about it that week because Drew was under the weather, to say the least. And yes. so we ended up not uh, watching it again night before last. And I, I forgot everything about it in the two weeks or whatever it was. I was like, this movie is so <laughs> forgettable. I can't even believe it. I could only remember that Bela Lugosi looks uh, awesomely crazy and that there's this ape that is sometimes a guy in an ape suit and sometimes an actual adorable ape um and that was pretty much all i could remember about and it was really violent um so i think it's just just kind of a forgettable film unfortunately um and and way way too too violent for my taste which as jason pointed out is because it was i haven't had to see movies like that because of the all the censors and whatever but yeah. and even this movie is super censored i mean it was supposed to be 80 minutes long and then they cut uh, a whole bunch of violence out of it and so it was only like an hour but um yeah i just it was not not my favorite wow okay tony uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this film before, but what are your thoughts on Murders in the Room work? It had been a really long time. I mean, I like it, but I it isn't, you know, my favorite movie. I, I think, for me, it works more as a historical piece on what pre-code movies are. Yeah. And, you know, there's some really, um, there's some interesting characters. Of, of course, Lugosi is amazing as an unhinged uh ape crossover scientist <laughs> like right interspecies experimenter um and you know flat out murderer yes uh sure it's pretty like pretty crazy role there's a lot of interesting stuff here you know i'd like to see more movies with the you know the detective um yeah you know, I, I think there's a there's a lot going on. And I think it's it's to me it's more interesting as a historical piece than an actual movie I would watch over and over. Right. 
Um, right. You know, even, you know, to the beginning where there's you know, the carnival and there's dancing women and they're making all kinds of jokes and just all this stuff that you don't, that seems a lot, again, because it's pre-code, that seems out of place in what you normally think of uh, in a movie from this era or what, yeah. what a lot of people think of as like, oh, black and white movies are this. Um, but yeah, it, and, you know, it's also a great Iron Maiden song. Yeah, that cool. makes a good companion piece to this movie. Um, Drew, why I you you sort of selected our our Bela Lugosi collection, um, and and I agree with Tony. I think there's a lot of stuff here to talk about just from just that, that's being presented here. It's not a lot to watch. It's 61 minutes long. Um, but what brings you to this piece? First of all, I really like this movie. Like I legitimately enjoy it. It's a movie that I watch not frequently as some other universal movies, but it's, it is a movie that I watch on the regular because I, I think this is one of Bela Lugosi's most sinister parts for sure. And, you know, for whatever issues the rest of the movie might have, like the romantic comedy stuff, uh, it seems like it's from a different movie than the mad scientist stuff to be sure um i also think this is a fascinating movie and it's an important movie in in the the mythology of the universal horror film because this movie mm. was created basically as a apology the reason why this project happened is universal was trying to appease both Lugosi and Robert Flory. Flory was originally actually did, you know, some uncredited on the the what what we know of as the James Well Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was actually lined up to direct it. And then Whale came in like a hurricane and knocked him out. Now, Lugosi, of course, famously turned down the monster uh, role. But what a lot of people don't know that the role that he actually cover coveted was in fact the role of Dr. Frankenstein. And I think there's a lot of reason why Dr. Miracle is the way he is. is I think this is probably would have been Lugosi's take on God, Frankenstein. can you imagine that? Can you That'd imagine Lugosi as Dr. Frankenstein? <laughs> I think, I don't think you have to, in case I think we have this movie. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. So the, the other thing is, is it's got Carl Freund, who of course also shot the last movie we talked about, uh, you know, dracula he directed the film the mummy and as well as one of my favorite uh you know old school horror films mad love and so this is a beautiful very impressionistic movie also you have a entirely different look at what a mad scientist's lab should look like mm. which is frankenstein which is very almost minimal and also very kinky in S and M. So yeah. I think this is a fascinating movie. There's a lot of interesting Hollywood characters in this. Noble Johnson uh, uh, plays uh, Lugosi's, you know, hench person, and he was he was a very interesting guy. Out in one level, he was playing these sort of stereotyped roles for african americans but you know on the side he was also producing movies some of the earliest movies were where african americans were the main characters and not forced to be in these stereotypes stereotype roles even the guy playing the gorilla charles gamora uh he was fascinating an important part of uh, makeup and you know he even you know we just did war of the worlds he designed the alien costume for war of the world so there, this movie is jam packed with mm. Hollywood history. So that is the other reason why I brought this movie to us. But it is a movie that I enjoy, and it is a movie that is very, as Tony said, an excellent example of how over top pre code horror could be. Um, but I love this movie, and I have a feeling this is going to be a good conversation. Wow! No, that that that's a lot. That's uh. That's that's a lot to think about. So uh, my my observation, <clears throat> there are a lot of neat things about about the culture in this film. I do think that Bell Lugosi is fascinating. You know, he he plays this role, and it's truly crazy. And just as we've remarked before, you know, it, so it, it, to the point where you should you should be tired of it. But I am still always amazed at Lugosi's breadth. You know, this is a very different character from Dracula, and it's a very different character from Igor. Um, 
he's he's just very very strange he's got wild kinky hair um as you mentioned he's got a crazy kinky set and and I've seen stuff that appears to have been invented in this movie used again and again. There was a 1970s Klaus Kinski, Jack the Ripper movie that lifts heavily from this film. I mean, heavily, uh, you know, I, so I, th- there is, there is a lot here, but boy, does it, it goes by pretty fast. And sometimes it gets side, side tracked with comedy that doesn't really do it any favors. But then if you got rid of the comedy bits, this movie would be like 40 minutes long. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, so why don't we just get into it? The um, the movie starts out. I do want to talk about Lugosi's performance, but before that, setting up where we find Lugosi, the movie starts out 1932, and as Tony mentioned, a carnival, a carnival in Paris, uh, in modern day in the 1930s, and. Uh, I believe it's in the 1930s, or is it set back prior? No, I'm sorry. There are carriages, so it's like the it's 1800s. Anyway, it's in Paris, and you have a bunch of people going to a whole bunch of culturally insensitive performances at the carnival, and I think that's the thing that amazes me the most. I don't know if this is intended to play as old-fashioned and offensive even to the people watching in the 1930s, but there's like all this crazy race stuff about Native Americans. You know, they, remember these are Parisians, so they're watching like, you know, see the Redskins from America as they scalp and steal the women and whatever, you know, and, and just all this sort of tittering and, and everything. Uh, yeah, I was that's mind blowing. I, w- I was wondering that as well as the, about, you know, was it as offensive back then? Obviously, our, you know, we were much more PC now, but. Our- are they saying those things to be shocking to the audience? You know, when they're saying, "Oh, they're they're going to scalp your children," or whatever it was, um, is that supposed to be shocking to the audience? Is my question. I don't know if you guys. At least it's to supposed that. to be lurid, because I mean, this is a yes. carnival midway, and that's the way carnival midway. No, no, but I mean, are. are the comments by are the comments by the guys supposed to be shocking? To, to us, the audience. What do you mean? The, the comments from the people who are watching the, the show? Yeah, when he's saying, you know, oh my gosh, they're going to scalp, you know, the, 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 in other words, the, 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 ho- the, uh, the, the MC the says The carnival it, barker? And then the guy, yeah. no, and then the guy in the audience with the, the top hat or whatever he's wearing says, you know, oh yeah, those guys are wild and da da da. Like, they're, they're just making all these comments. And I'm wondering if we, the audience who are, watching the film in that time are supposed to be shocked by how offensive these people's comments are about these wild Indians, quote unquote. Um, my aunt, my or, guess, by or the way, are they, or is it just, that's just what everybody said. Uh, my guess would be no, because I've watched a lot of TV shows from the fifties <laughs> and, and it was still not that, uh, not that enlightened. So I, I have a, uh, I, you know, but now you watch it and, it it gives you a really good view, I think, of where the more where more lurid ideas about about race and and culture was uh, in in the early 30s. Uh, uh, that's my that's my guess. Um, but that's a fun sequence, you know, as as the the guys are joshing the women and the women are joshing the guys, and it's it's uh, yeah. You know, it's a carnival. And as they make their and think how many movies we've watched that open like that, like Torture Garden opened almost in exactly the same way, you know, with with the carnival barkers and the couples kind of, kind of joshing one another along and, and and everything. It's a it's a really a wonderful way to begin any picture, I think, uh, is is with with couples sort of clinging together at a carnival. It's one of my favorite images. Um, so they get to. A different Barker, which is uh, which is the tent of Doctor Miracle, Doctor or Doctor Miracle, or however you say it, who is uh, do they, Miracle, Miracle. Doctor Miracle, uh, and and which rhymes with grackle and makes you think of it. And you go into this tent, and you have an opening presentation from Bela Lugosi himself. And uh, uh, Drew, would you like to describe the presentation of Bela Lugosi in this role? And by the way, if you can find a doll of Dr. Miracle, I want that. But uh, go, <laughs> That'd be go ahead. <laughs> yes. But, it's yeah. sort of a fever dream version of Darwinian science. I mean, he's talking about how, uh, you know, this is 
this is you know eric you know his gorilla or ape they call him an ape they never really specify you know he he's pl played by either a man in an ape suit or or a uh when he's in close up it's it's an actual uh an actual chimpanzee because mm -hmm. uh, and 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 unfortunately neither look that much alike uh you know that is right i i kind of just wish even though it's one of the things that would have dated the movie i kind of just wish that they had stuck with a with the gorilla suit 100 percent of the time but sure. uh you know lugosi you know he goes into this the you know this this speech about uh you know how man comes from ape and you know he's talking about evolution and everything but it's done in this very high gothic very bizarre way you know he's he he's underlit everything is very sinister and you know then he starts talking to the ape like in this this like sort of chittering made up language yes and you know the ape is in the prime of his life and he's lonely he wants a, he, he wants uh you know some meat and yeah you know the the whole thing is very bizarre and to me contextually you know because like we still have people who debate evolution now yeah. you know so 1932 i imagine being someone being somewhat suspicious of a uh evolutionary scientist you know th this this kind of probably made sense you know it, it, it in a way even though it's you know like it is rather bizarre because like you know natural you know if when you when you you meet real life naturalists they're usually not not even remotely like this well it's yeah so it's a it's such a wonderful mixture of so he does give a little speech about evolution you know the four-legged creature walked upright and wings became ears and and all this stuff so if the movie's supposed to take place in 1845 origin of the species doesn't even come out until 1859 i'm, I'm sure that there's plenty of of thought going on before the book comes out but but never so it would be a like a wild and crazy idea in 1845 but really important for americans this movie comes out in 1932 the Scopes Monkey Trial was in 1925, where a guy was on trial for teaching evolution in a school in the United States. That's just like, what, seven years earlier? So, I mean, you're right. It is it is like dead solid center, uh, you know, part of the national consciousness. So this guy is all about proving evolution. But then he hauls out a really crazy idea. Before we get to it, I just want to describe what he looks like. Uh Bell Lugosi, it, it, you said he was like a fever dream of a of a scientist or something. There is something really feverish about him. He's tall. He's skinny. His hair is wild and crazy. I don't know if it's a wig or if it's just his own like wavy hair, grown out. Um, he has a unibrow, that is bizarre. He's always lit from below. And he has his own uh, Hungarian accent in, like, full flower. So he's like, you know, um, you will see none of the usual hocus pocus. I just love the way he talks, you know. And then, and then he, he brings out and he goes, okay, believe me, evolution's a thing. Um, and I'm going to prove it by mixing the blood of this ape and a human. And I'm sitting here in 2018 and... I don't know what that means. I literally don't. I was like listening to that and going, what does that mean? Does that mean that he wants to impregnate a female or impregnate an ape or like, no, he actually wants, we soon find out to, uh, to basically do some like literally on slide blood mixing and reinjecting and stuff. But, but we'll get to that. Well, Inside, step, yeah. step two is definitely, he wants to hook up a woman with an ape. I guess so. Uh, it seems it's, to it's be that 1932 and even pre code, they couldn't outright say that, but let's be real, that's pretty heavily implied. I think that's kind of what he's saying. I'm in the prime of my strength, <laughs> you know. Yes, um, uh, but it's uh, modern it, day, he makes uh, Tinder for apes and, and uh, <laughs> um, my new app. It's what's, you what's... can meet all the apes, you can meet, you can. Hang out with the apes. What's, I highly recommend 
there there are many good apes you can talk to well what's <laughs> what's bizarre about this is um the pseudoscience here because it, it doesn't actually um hold up but uh you know fans of 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 bizarre governmental uh uh, experiments uh, will know J joseph stalin was actually a fan of this movie and he actually wanted to try this and uh, to create a race of, of super soldiers combining uh combining apes and 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 people and he thought that this could actually somehow be done so like like you know it's really weird to think about that, like coming out there that, that somebody would watch this and take this seriously because it feels barely scientific, like which is yet another reason why a, a actual scientist is probably better than a mad scientist. Hmm. Yeah, I, I totally see what you mean. He, he, like he's a scientist who's kind of gone mad. And, and as we'll find out after we set up the main characters, he's up to some really rough tricks to try to to try to get this experimenting uh to work and uh holy god jesus christ i mean we we will soon find out he's a full on uh, he uh yeah he has no he has no empathy for the people who who he does is experimenting on but <clears throat> uh before we get to that visiting him in the big top He's just giving you his plan. Nobody knows quite what he means. He's like, I'm all into this thing called evolution that you'll hear about, I swear to God, in a couple of years. And uh, I'm going to mix ape and people blood. And um, now, okay, show's over. Come meet the ape. And he goes, you can go up to the cage. He's very friendly. It's not a problem. So, like... Uh, our friend August du <laughs> Dupin uh, and his his girlfriend. Is it Pierre? Uh, Pierre Dupin. Pierre Dupin, yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and his his girlfriend Camille walk up to the cage. The ape takes her bonnet, and then tries to kill Pierre like instantly, like. He and just grabs Bella's him like, through the bars. You fool! You fool! I'm you like, fool. What do you mean, you fool! You told him to go up there. <laughs> you said it was very safe. You said I had nothing to fear, <laughs> yeah. but no. Um, and and you know, Doctor Morocco. <laughs> well, yeah. safe is you know, judging by what we see later, his view of safety, I think, is yes, is radically different <laughs> from the everyman's view of safety. So, yes. to, in his defense, he might it might be really safe, but yes. you gotta. There's the, his sampling of safety is not the norm, so. In his sliding well, also, scale, perhaps it's safe. Plus, I think he's there's also just like I wonder what'll happen. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. He wants he wants that ape, I think, to like Camille. I, I don't. There's there's a lot we're missing. I don't think we're missing necessarily from film stuff. I think it's just there's stuff that we're missing in the movie we're watching. Like he clearly takes a liking to Camille for this ape pretty quickly, and he wants this boyfriend out of the way. So he's kind of practicing a sort of a dominance trick here to like lull Pierre into a sense of safety and then show him to be kind of a fool and a coward, thereby in his mind kind of pumping himself up and I guess by extension his ape up in the eyes of Camille because he immediately says, hey, where do you live, baby? I'll send you a new hat. And, and uh, Pierre, having quickly recovered his wits, goes, no, no, that's cool. Keep the hat and, and <laughs> we're leaving. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, that's... That's uh, that really girl, funny. by the way. Oh God, she drove me crazy. This this character um, of the uh, what, what Camille is her name? Yeah, um, she she drove me bonkers with her naivete and her reliance on her boyfriend. Whatever you say, Pierre. Okay, huh? Like he's like, what? Um, oh, he wants. He sent me a, I got this hat. Guess guess who it's from? And he can't even, this bonnet, you know. He's like, can't even, the boyfriend can't even fathom who it could be from. And then she says it's from Dr. Miracle. And he's like, oh, but we didn't give him your address. And she's like, oh, yeah. Huh? And then he's like, she wants, he wants me to come to his house. And he's like, you shouldn't do that. And she says, well, why not? And I'm just like, oh, my God. I'm just like throwing things to the screen. <laughs> Like, dude, you deserve to go be the ape's bride. As, if, too... as if his ape attacked me. Right. Like, is it enough to go, maybe we shouldn't trust that guy. But I'm sure it was. I'm you sure say whatever you say, dear. 
whatever you say. That's what it, I think is the most offensive thing about this movie is the, infa- I, this is going to sound dumb to say, but the infantilization of this woman who appears to have not a brain in her head. She is like an eight-year-old walking around in a 22-year-old's body, you know, and and that's just, that is really dumb, well, you know. So the... The actress, I, I can't speak to the screenwriting because that might just have been a function of the time. But uh, th- th- this actress who 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 plays this character, she sh- Sydney Fox, she she actually was dating Charles Limley Jr., who was the producer of this and and most Universal horror films. And it's actually a big reason why she was in this movie hmm. and uh why she was actually top billed on the poster over Lagosi, which is absurd <laughs> um, I, do, I i i i you know i don't think anybody could could make a you know solid argument as to why that but um she's the role the romance stuff in this movie while i really like this movie the romance stuff in this movie doesn't really like like her her as a character doesn't work and honestly like she's just kind of a plot device so mm-hmm. so julia i do get why you're probably especially as a 21st century woman why you're probably deeply frustrated by this character yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, I got to mention, by the way, she's like 20. I said she's 22, and she is about 22. She's around there. Uh, and she is dead within 12 years. She dies of a Aww, of a sad. sleeping pill overdose. And uh, and let's, let's see, what year is that? <clears throat> 1942. 10 years. So that's unfortunate. I also, I, I, I also should mention uh, this... The stuff with them, you're right. The 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 dialogue uh, in the romance is very stilted, but there's some great cinematography. Weirdly enough, like there's the business when well, that's because it's she's... Carl Freund, baby. Right. That guy. No, he does some amazing stuff. Like there's one where you know that boring scene, or it would be more boring when when uh, she's saying, "Hey, somebody sent me a hat. I wonder which stalker it is." That conversation is happening in a park while he's hanging out and like pushing her on the swing the camera is following her on the swing as he comes in and out of focus while she keeps moving and it's really neat i mean that's really really an innovative shot that you know because it causes the causes her to stay static as the world around her swings back and forth i mean and that was neat i i I liked that 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 shot a great deal um anyway we set them up and we also set up the fact that i guess she's the prettiest girl in paris because bella lugosi instantly likes her and wants to figure out how to um how to maybe maybe she will be a good candidate if he can figure out this blood mixing thing that he's into but to accomplish that we get the harrowing violence of this movie and holy crap because it starts out with a fairly traditional movie abduction thing where he jack the ripper style sneaks up on on a prostitute and kidnaps her well actually it's kind of funny he saves her from a from a john that's roughing her up only to to do her in yes himself, which is a little, a little yeah there's this whole f- the whole fight going on yeah yeah, that's right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's all the only thing. I think that's kind of funny in a way. Yeah, and and weird because it's just all this extra violence, right? So that's going on, and then uh, you know he brings her along, and she his abduction of her is also very strange, because he walks up to her and he's like, "No, you need to come with me," and she's like, "No, I don't want to," but she does just does, and it's re- a really frustrating thing where you're like. Uh, you know, the, unfortunately, well, this is a, abductions like this actually do happen, where people, for whatever reason, no. Don't but run I don't think. The thing is, I mean, I have to believe that in a scenario like that, you gotta play the odds, and you see that, that you know this guy's here. There's nobody else around except for his henchmen, um, and you know it's probably in her in her world if you uh put up a fight you're just gonna get you know beaten up and then they're still gonna take you so i think she's probably just going i don't see my options being good here and of course now we know you know don't ever go with the, what is it that um don't ever uh, go to the second location with the the well i can't remember what the thing was well, from like woodstock it, it was never <laughs> follow a 
Never follow a hippie to a second location. Yeah, exactly. But this would be, but, you know, never follow Bell no, Lugosi to a second location. Right, yes. but the thing is, I mean, we know that now, but I really feel like in her situation, if she tried to run, she would have gotten killed. I mean, I think that that's was that was going to happen. So she I think she was just playing the odds. Yeah, so that's bad for her because we next come into like a... 1970s style grindhouse torture scene that I was just flabbergasted to see in a 19. Forgive me for being so innocent here, but I was just astonished to see this in a 1930s movie. She is writhing in pain, tied to a big cross, while he is cutting her with a knife and telling her to shut up. It is really wild, and I I was just I I, I was blown away by by this level of of violence in a in a universal no, it's really shocking i mean did, did, did you guys have the same the same reaction yeah it wasn't expected like i had forgotten about it i guess because i hadn't seen the movie in a while like holy crap <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i kind of this is um this is a movie i like to show to people who who think that old movies can't be shocking yeah, right. old, old horror films can't actually be scary um you know, I uh, I I even remember the last is part of a um, Bella Lugosi DVD collection that Jamie got me for Christmas a few years ago, and I remember when we got around to watching this, um, you know, the first time, you know, she was quite shocked about how how grisly and mm-hmm. and perverse this stuff is, and. You know, I, you know, your mileage may vary. Obviously, you know, Julia's not into that, and I and I get it. And you know, I'm not saying that you know that's wrong or right, but you know, people have this preconceived notion of what an old movie is going to be like, and this movie mm-hmm. is definitely kind of a swift chop to the neck. And and you know, it's it's like getting a cold blast of water in your face. It really wakes you up to like what your preconceived notions might be and how wrong they are and you know i i i i think this is still a you know at least in places a very effective horror film Mm. no very much i I have to say cloris bleachman gets killed in kiss me deadly in a very similar kind of scene that's 1955 they treat it with more fear and reticence and uh uh, I don't know what the word would be obscurity than than this one. You know, it's a very very similar thing though. If you've ever wanted to see Cloris Meach, Cloris Leachman in an earlier terrifying role, but uh, yeah, uh, so that's wild. But what's he doing? He presumably right before the scene, uh, you know, she's up on a sort of a a gallows kind of thing that she's also hanging from, and also yes, it does. If you you know, I'm sure for for if you're into this sort of thing, it also has a has a very sort of S and M kind of vibe to it. He is cutting her. In theory, he has already injected her with ape DNA, I guess, or something. And now he's drawing some blood out by cutting her and taking a blood sample, and then putting that under the microscope to see if it mixes properly. But apparently, it never does. This is what I'm understanding from what I'm watching. And so it doesn't work. And then, since he's injected her with the ape blood, she also dies. And I guess this just keeps happening. Like, it, it hasn't... I don't think it's, that it's mix, not mixing properly. He says that it's black. I mean, it's like her blood rotten, rotten blood. Yeah. Her rotten blood, yes. It's been poisoned by this ape blood. And I don't know that he's cutting her. I think he's just... Isn't he just in, uh, using, a, uh, like, a syringe to... to not a syringe... Blood? It's a. It seems to be a razor of some kind, oh, really? because he, I don't think he has a syringe. I don't think they're. I'm not it even sure. It looks like they, a surgical knife. I mean, right. Okay. He's just cutting away at her at her her forearm. Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's, it's truly truly awful. Anyway, this experiment that he's doing is not going awry. Now, there's a plot issue here because he also wants Camille. And I don't know if he is hoping that he's going to figure out all of his experimentation with these, like, these, like, lesser women, these, these street women, and so, and so forth, before doing whatever he's going to do with Camille, or if she's Camille's just going to be a another. Guarantee. Right. I, I guess. I, I don't. I don't know. In that. other words, 
does he plan that he's going to try it again on Camille and she might die too? I really don't know what. I think what... he really does just want to see, because, I mean, there's plenty of, if it, if it works with this woman, there's no reason to believe he's going to stop with her. He's probably going to keep doing it. But, um, yeah, he's just, that he's he's always just kind of, you know, hedging his bets and see what, what, he's, what he can come well, up the, with in the, the moment. I, the idea that you have all these women in peril, though, goes back to this, um, even though that they're, they're, they're street walkers or whatever, you know, it's just this so very, uh, you know, very old-fashioned notion. And, you know, we saw this in the last Lugosi movie that we did, where, which was Dracula, is that women are pure and women are in peril and the men must protect the women. Yeah. And, you know, like, I... Well, he even says the line, Bella, De- Bella goes, he's like, I, are you a damsel in distress? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> He's like Not delicious. Yet, but, uh, <laughs> well, no, she already right. kind of was. And now she's even more oh, so. Yeah. Um, Can I yeah, just point out? Guess... By the way, there is a Doctor Morocco doll. Oh my god! So Hilarious. yeah, actually, it's a model kit. But still, once you have it, it's like a, it's a, it's you know, an eight foot, eight inches. Uh, no. 13 inch tall Dr. Miracle with his walking stick and his little plaque placard, you know, making his lectures could be on your desk. His, Man, his, I... his, his, and his <laughs> diploma from evil metal medical school. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say, I know that we're trying to make this podcast twice as long as the actual film, but, <laughs> but um, I did want to move on to the point where uh, she is now dead and at, and is at the at the morgue, which I assume is why this movie is called the Murders at Rue Morgue. It's probably because it's the morgue, the street the morgue is on. Um, yes. But anyway, so we're at the morgue, and I love that the constable who has found, or the cop who's found, who, or whoever it is that has brought in the body of this poor woman. Um, the 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 court the the crypt keeper you know the, yes. the morgue keeper guy he's like just he asks whoever brings the body and he just asks them questions there's no examination or anything he's just like um how old do you think they are ah thousand thirty it doesn't matter put whatever you want and then he's like um profession yes he says yeah isn't that interesting <laughs> it's just like okay <laughs> Yeah, I guess there's just the one profession for women. That's what, oh, that yeah, funny. and that's what we're meant to understand for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, golly, uh, yeah. Um, and and the cool thing is, there really is, you know, this element of of scientific police work going on here. In this case, you have this detective who is actually a, a you know a medical student and you know so through the course of things he's observing things about the wounds and seeing things that other people don't see and you know i i'm no poe expert but i know that this is a thing that poe was a huge a huge uh I, I don't know uh he was laying down tracks for what a detective story should be so that is super important i mean that's probably the most important element of the story, the murders in the room morgue, more so than the than the uh, marauding ape, is the introduction of a Sherlock Holmes kind of kind of character well, prior I mean, to yeah, Sherlock Holmes. Pose, you know, pose Sherlock Holmes in a way. Right, but, that's uh, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, we now know, but basically, the the two storylines come sort of hurtling together very quickly, because because the professor is interested in Camille, and meanwhile Dupin is interested in these murders, and very quickly what happens is we get to the plot of the actual short story, which is a murder takes place and a woman is stuffed in a chimney, and the people can't figure out what the nationality of the murderer was because they all heard a different language. And what did they hear? They heard the chittering of an ape. And uh, uh, so that's, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying that's so silly. Well, th- but that's <laughs> literally the plot of the story. That is what happens. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, Camille's mother is murdered and stuffed up a chimney. And Dupin is uh, briefly uh questions about okay, the before okay so then about that part so you have boyfriend um telling uh the ignorant camille that she needs to lock her doors but why pierre <laughs> right <laughs> but anyway and so he's like just just do what i'm saying because you're in danger and so then she's like okay fine so i guess she locks her door and then um and then you see Bella Lugosi down at the bottom of the stairs and he says um okay uh what's the ape's name again <laughs> 
Eric. Oh, you, Eric. Eric, thank you, Eric. He's like, okay, Eric. Um, and then Eric waves his hand out of the carriage. <laughs> so Eric is just sitting like some civilized gentleman in the carriage waiting to be told that he can get out. That he can go in and kidnap <laughs> and he's the like, girl. Yeah, I'm here. And he's like, go on up to her now. And so he climbs the outside of the building and goes into the window, which, which you know, kudos to Eric. That's pretty brilliant. Um, and he, um, goes and gets, that's when he kills the mom. So, but I just thought that was hilarious that you got this ape in this carriage kind of like, oh, hey, that yeah, is I'm here. very funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's hanging his arm out the window, yeah, you know, yeah. like he's going to okay. buy a newspaper or something. Uh -huh. Yes. And I should mention this Pierre Dupin thing. I, I didn't, I wanted to look at the dates really quickly, but he did predate, uh, Sherlock Holmes. It's thought of as the first modern detective story because, you know, he, it was, he, figures things out by observing them, uh, you know, very intently in ways other people don't. And he finds like hairs that don't match, you know, a human and, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. I mean, also we get... found the prototype for Dark Knight being a Dark Knight detective, which I always think, I always like the stories where oh, yes. the detective work comes in, you know? Absolutely. Yes. It's especially frustrating, actually, when you have a detective story and they don't do detecting. So, yes, you know, uh, I'm I'm in for that. Anytime somebody's like, yeah, and then he finds a tuft of hair and says, look, this tuft of hair is not human or, or whatever. Uh, that's great stuff. I, I love all of that. And um, well, especially when you got idiot Keystone cops who are like, oh, you're the the lover. OK, well, you stay here because obviously you did it <laughs> cops are, like wait the cops are useless in this thing they're they're all a bunch of napoleonic you know soldiers who just they're just morons uh so we get to a finale happens super fast which is uh eric so first of all for reasons i don't recall eric murders dr miracle i don't know why precisely uh, and I apologize for not knowing. He just, he turns up, maybe because Eric doesn't want to see Dr. Mur he wants the girl for himself. He doesn't want uh, Miracle to be involved with her. Anyway, he murders um, Miracle off screen, but we see the shadow. And then he goes running around the rooftop with the girl. Now, this is a fun sequence. Drew, didn't, w I know that you're a big fan of ape movies, and, uh, and Tony, you are too. Uh, so either one of you could answer this, but I'm seeing a lot of like pre King Kong, uh, stuff here. Well, you know, King Kong, you know, comes out, you know, I, I believe a year after this, maybe a year or two, but you know, I, I don't know if this was a direct influence on Kong, but it's kind of hard to think that it wasn't. You know, the idea that this gorilla is like carrying a young woman, you know, across this urban, you know, admittedly very fairy tale impressionistic urban landscape, but an urban lands landscape. And this is, it does feel like sort of the prototypical ending to a monster movie as well, because you have the hero chasing the monster who has the girl and, you know, which is very you know yeah. much like something out of kong but also like a million other monster movies mm -hmm. you know it you know universal you know because this was right after dracula you know frankenstein and this come out relatively close to each other you know this is this is universal sort of developing a language for yeah. what their horror films is going to be like which is another reason why i wanted to talk to this this movie because you still can't have all the movies that came after this without this movie because this is definitely <laughs> you know part of developing that 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 sort of filmic dialogue with your with, with you know that we that we've become so used to um you said you said it's like a fairy tale and i have to say i totally agree it's beautiful up there this is a presentation of of the the skyline of paris in uh 1845 and i think to the audience in 1932 it must look incredibly exotic and beautiful and it does to, i have to say today it looks very exotic and beautiful you know what these sets are by the way these are leftover lab om sets and they're gorgeous i mean it's just fantastic the roof well, everything well, flory's um style that he was going for in this movie was heavily influenced by the cabinet of dr caligari 
Mm. And I, I think if you if you really want to have fun, and considering that neither movie is particularly long, if you really want to have a fun day of of watching old horror films, you know, dig up a copy of the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and watch this uh, and that back to back, because like, and just kind of noticing the stylistic uh, choices between the two of them. That is a wonderful idea. I have to say also the other thing that I was getting a lot of hints of was uh curse of the werewolf with oliver reed very similar the wandering around remember because in that one everybody's down in the street as oliver reed is fleeing on the rooftops and and they're watching him and and shooting at him uh and i i think i don't know if that was deliberately influenced but uh it's only about 25 years later you know I- at least subconsciously influenced because it could have been influenced by other movies that were influenced by this one. Mm. Because I mean, universal through the, you know, through Dracula and Frankenstein and then this movie and what came after, you know, really were inventing what modern horror films were going to be. And, you know, everything hammer did was it made in reaction. I mean, nothing hammer could have done. did, you know, Hammer yeah. was very much rooted in 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 the Universal movies, even even if sometimes only to do the go the opposite route. But you know, like the the, the fingerprints are of course going to be there. Yeah. Uh, so beautiful scene, and uh, Pierre winds up rescuing the girl and shooting uh, shooting Eric, who plummets into the Seine. Uh, and that's the end. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, 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 again, they cut this movie down because apparently they had some violence that I can't even imagine what the heck those scenes would have been, but it means that it moves along at a, at a very steady clip. Uh, what, 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 what is there that, that we should discuss that we may, we perhaps haven't, haven't touched on before we get, uh, to our final thoughts. Um, on on this or do you just just want to go to our our final thoughts because it is a fairly short film i i i i i kind of wonder if the reason why this movie was thought to be a little bit too lurid in 1930 standards like you know obviously there's like a lot of violence or whatever but there's also kind of a weird religiosity about the way he tortures these women on a on a crucifix Mm. you know or or a cross at the and what's with it and is is his prayer is he appears to pray or plead with god yeah somehow yeah after okay. yeah i can't understand that at all i i i I, I, do... I wonder if that was one of the things that really sent people through the roof about this movie because that's that's you know very outrageous you know and you know i uh, you know and yeah i love that all that stuff is in there Sure. You know, you know, no, I like boring. I like weird choices uh, much more than I like you know boring choices. So the, I I agree. I'm I'm all for it. Uh, it's it's that is pretty cool. Uh, and again, that is an arresting scene. You know, remember how we've said a million times, like all I really want out of a movie is a couple of good things to remember, because you know it all it all goes together i think given bell lugosi's performance and how completely unhinged violent he is uh those are two things that that you have to think about and talk about when when we we talk about this film um, and and yet this was this was this movie was one of the reasons why a lot of people a lot of people feel uh that Lugosi kind of fell out of favor with Universal and they started pushing Karloff over him is that the audiences didn't quite take to this movie the way they took to, to Dracula, Um, you know, which is a shame because it's, it's a very, um, what, 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 Tony? No, I said, absolutely. It's a shame because there's a lot going on. It's just, you know, definitely probably what it's just, People weren't expecting, you know. But I mean, you should, yeah, you, you can't imagine. Performance. Surely you can have more, because a lot of people have a, a whole string of flops before. So I've, I, I also have heard the same thing that it was like uh, Dracula makes him a big star. This one doesn't do well. Universal then punishes him after this, and, and that's sort of the end. Uh, that's not, I, well, wait a minute. We know that's not quite true because he's in, he plays Igor, he plays the monster, he'll, he'll turn up. I, well, and they so were perfectly it, happy to do a whole series of of Boris Karloff Lugosi team up movies. Yeah. 
So I don't, I'm not sure it lines up to say this is what, this is how you source the beginning of the end for Lugosi. I have a feeling Lugosi's problems were probably highly personal. I, I, you know, I know that his substance abuse issues began to affect him, you know, and I, I, I don't know. Also, bear in mind, man's not young. You know, by the, by the fifties, Bell Lugosi was definitely past his prime, probably capable of doing great work. But you know, this is just this is just what happens to you when you're an actor. Is you is is uh, is stuff goes down. My point is, I think you don't have to blame murders in the Rue Morgue for what happened to Bell Lugosi's career. Well, and this is now so also long ago that all that the the it's it, it becomes conjecture. But the you know the important thing, and you're going to hear me say this a lot throughout this entire retrospective. The important thing, you know, people love to talk about the downfall of Bell Lugosi because a lot of people's first exposure to Bell Lugosi is not even through Lugosi himself, but through the excellent uh, Tim Burton ed wood yeah. film which which really played up this this sort of tragedy of lugosi but the, the bottom line is lugosi is effectively immortal there's a reason why we're still talking about his movies and mm. you know like like so like ultimately like where it, on a cosmic level like where is the tragedy in that because wow that's a really you know, interesting point is Bell Lugosi is no longer with us, but his work is. So what is the point in mourning for Lugosi, you know, instead of just watching Lugosi's movies and being well, glad? Well, and, ce- and celebrating his 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 talent. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, actors strive to create characters that are memorable, and you know, we started this retrospective with Dracula, but like you know Lugosi was so much more than Dracula and that's another reason why I wanted to show show this film is because as you've said this movie is 180 degrees away from being Dracula you know he he, this is a very different character oh and he puts his all in it you know he's a real he's a real artist He, he doesn't you know it wasn't a thing where Bela Lugosi is a very genteel person, and so he just played Dracula as himself, and there it is. Bela Lugosi is a performer. He brings a new interpretation to every every character that he plays, and and I think looking at this gives you a new awareness, if you didn't already have it, that you're actually looking at a master actor, and it it is. Think how boring this character could have been in the hands of almost anybody else. There are so many choices on the screen by Lugosi that are bonkers. And he and I'm, you know, I, I'm just so amazed at, at what I'm seeing. So, yeah. Um, well, let's get our, our final thoughts. Uh, it was Julia, Tony, Drew, and then me. And then we'll come around to endorsements. Julia, uh, I, I know that we've already pounded on how great Lugosi's performance is, but do you have any other final thoughts on uh, on this movie? So, yeah, I mean, as I've been talking about it, I've been think- I have laughed a few times at some of the things that were funny, some- sometimes intentionally, so it's sometimes not intentionally. Um, and so I think that probably... I'm- I enjoyed it more than I maybe gave it credit for at the beginning because I did think it was funny. <laughs> but um, the uh, another note that I had was that the char- the actor who plays Pierre um, felt so much like a silent film actor. You know, like a Cla- is it Claude Rains or who, mm. who was the who was it that you said that? Oh was, no, that, uh... Uh, playing Pierre, playing the uh, the the love interest. Uh, yeah, I am finding it. I'm Leon, sorry. Leon, no, 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 no. yeah. No, but I just mean yeah. you had said, Jason, that the, when I said he reminded me of a, fi- a silent film star, you were you said you mentioned a specific person that he does. Yeah, that he I said like. that he he looks really he's well, really wanna, prettied up, so he looks well, you like. Wanna, go you want to know what you'll know him from Julia? That yeah. he looked quite he was quite a bit older. Is that he was Wilbur's neighbor on uh, that actor was Wilbur's neighbor on Mr. Ed? Oh, really? <laughs> he <laughs> that's funny. But no, he, but here, I just mean here he, he has, has that. White, yeah. yeah, he's got all the makeup up and he's got just kind of the exaggerated you know expressions and he just seems to act with his face a lot 
and I just felt like um, you know you could really see the the silent film influence still in the yes. in the performance. Um, yeah. And uh, what else? Um, you know, I mean, I think we've hit on most of the notes that I had. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting study. I, I, I think that uh, you guys are spot on when you're talking about how people don't expect this kind of thing when they think about old films. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably true for me is that I'm, I was shocked that I was shocked. You know, I was shocked that there was, that there was so much to be shocked about in a film at this point. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, definitely interesting conversation for sure. Very cool. Tony? What about you? Yeah, I think uh, actually Drew's um, exuberance for the movie, I think <clears throat> now I kind of reevaluate. Again, it, it's not a favorite movie of mine, but I uh, there's a lot of stuff there that's really great. Um, and of course, no matter what, you should watch it for Lugosi uh, playing a mad scientist who in some ways has some legit science and in other ways is truly <laughs> unhinged. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's a it's a cool pre-code movie. Um, even if you want to watch it just for the history, it's only like an hour. So yeah, go. I do true. kind of. I wish that there was an eighty-minute version. I didn't find one. You know, I guess it ended up long, long gone. But uh, I would truly be interested to see what was on the cutting room floor. Um, you know, was I would it too. was it lured for the time, or would we actually go back again? Remark that wow, that is that is intense, even for the time period. I'm you know, I wish we knew, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's you know, it's a great romp. You know, any I'll watch many, many a Poe adaptation, so uh, they all bring something different to the table. Um, you know, and all of them become, I think, part of our especially in horror, the lexicon for horror is stuff like this. This is the mad scientist. This, you know, is informed by uh, Caligari. It perhaps does inform Kong, um, you know, Jack the Ripper type stories. All of, all of these things, you know, d don't just come in a modern, like they, they just sprung up in modern era horror and they were, you know, in a vacuum. I think the more people go back, again, I always tell people if you want to really add something to your fiction watch the things that the people you admire watched yes and if you yeah. if you can watch the things that they watched um you'll you'll end up being less of kind of flavor of their or era yeah and more like just the same with art the further you can go back in our history even if it's art that you don't particularly enjoy you know knowing your stuff in that i think helps a lot it's not necessary you know for everyone but i think you'll be your art can become a lot richer if you choose to deep dive you know Very good. but uh, certainly this movie is is a fantastic uh example of you know pre-code black and white it, it lends itself towards what we see now and you know influence tons of people leading up to the people that we admire and watch today wonderful uh, that was that was really great, and I loved what you said. By the way, about watch what your heroes watch and watch what they watch what they watch. Absolutely, um, Mr. Drew. What are your thoughts? You know, I I, I do sometimes wonder why a uh, Robert Flory Frankenstein film mm -hmm. with Bela Lugosi as Doctor Frankenstein how that would have looked, and I wouldn't trade the James Well Frankenstein for anything because it's it's an amazing film, but this is kind of an you know every time i watch this i kind of get curious about what that sort of you know if i could just peek into that alternate universe and see what that frankenstein movie would have been like i i i kind of would that film um this is this is a fun movie to discuss and i we did get a good discussion out of it which is what i was hoping yeah. for and you know it's just a i i really like this movie and i you know like i i'm sorry that you know julia didn't care for it but you know like i do think it was still important if we're doing lugosi the touch on this movie because this was the movie that came right after dracula and uh, you know i i i think that this the, you know as the person that was picking out these movies this 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 would not have been done right had i not put this movie in the into the into the deck to discuss um so i'm just happy that we discussed it i'm happy that we got a good discussion out of it and i i'm happy that my my uh, you know as as tony said my exuberance for it was a little bit infectious 
on on everybody else because i i hope going forward as we continue to look at lagosi uh you know rents will continue to come through and you know reflect in you guys and our listeners who i hope are going to get something out of this you know and enjoy watching these films with us and and you know learning you know experiencing you know doing this thing we do cool Wonderful. Uh, I would have nothing to add to that. You all, you all said it really perfectly. Uh, so let's do our endorsements. Uh, by the way, before we do that, uh, Drew, do you recall what our next Lugosi movie is? Uh, I believe I... it is The Black Cat. Oh my gosh. Now we're getting into some really, really recognized classics. So that is going to be really cool. Uh, all right. And we'll, we'll announce that super f- super soon so let's do endorsements um same order i think it was julia tony drew and then if i have anything to endorse i will let you know tony do you have anything to endorse a couple things i'm going to keep it to horror though since we're doing black cat i am going to recommend i think i've recommended it before uh koroneko the black cat which is a black and white uh japanese film which i really enjoy uh that I, I picked up a lot of things, perhaps too much, in the Criterion half-off sale that Barnes & Noble has <laughs> going on. I think it ends tomorrow. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed was a box set, uh, Eclipse Series 37, When Horror Came to Shochiku, which has X, the X from Outer Space, Goke the Body Snatcher from Hell, the Living Skeleton and Genocide. And The Living Skeleton is amazing. I hadn't seen it before. Um, it's very EC Comics. Gets a little bit more violent than I expected. Um, again, it, I don't know exactly what I expected, but there's some things in it that were really creepy and creeped me out uh, in ways that I was like, oh, I don't know. This is a, can be a hard one to recommend because of how dark it gets in a couple places. But uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing box set. Uh, and if you do have a day to, you know, get stuff from, from Criterion, um, especially since, sadly, Filmstruck is over. They're hoping to make a Criterion channel next year. Um, but for now, the only way to see a lot of these movies is, you know, through Blu-ray and DVD until mm. something else comes along. But uh, I highly recommend this box set. Um, there's some crazy town amazing stuff here uh, that that is really super fantastic. Very, very cool. Mr. Drew, do you have anything to endorse? Well, you know, we just lost Stan Lee, actually, while I was uh, not doing too well myself. Um, and, you know, he, he was 94, 95. That's a great run and a, an amazing life by anyone's standards but nonetheless you know i can think of no other writer that's probably more influential on my own dialogue as a writer than stan lee so i i've i've really been going back and looking at a lot of his comics particularly you know the legendary run that he did with you know jack kirby on fantastic four so uh, you know a lot of people think of Stan Lee in, in a part of this was by his own design, admittedly, as just this uh, guy that shows up and did cameos in Marvel movies. But I know also a lot of our readers are comic book fans. And what I would invite you, what I would like you to do is maybe go back and, and look at some of these old comic books from the 60s and really look at the origins of of the whole marvel thing Mm. and you know like maybe appreciate you know who he was as a writer and who he was as an editor which he really was underappreciated i i talked about this on facebook totally underappreciated as an editor you know people people think of him as this you know primarily like a hype man and then you know as a as a comic book writer but you know, as an editor, he might be the one of the best editors the comic book industry has ever had. And, you know, it's actually so, several, seldomly discussed. And so, like, I would say, if you're able to, go to a comic book store and get some Silver Age Marvel comics and really it's dig into idea. some Stan Lee. And, you know, maybe develop a different appreciation for the guy beyond the sort of fun, admittedly, cartoon character that he turned himself into which, you know, he was a great hype man. I'm not going to say that he wasn't. And probably the best ambassador 
that comic books will ever have. But, you know, I think he think a little bit of appreciation for the actual talent that the guy had is is needed now. And yes, okay, we know about Jack Kirby, we know Steve Di- know about Steve Ditko and all of his collaborators. And I'm not trying to take anything away from that but i am saying stan lee as again a writer and an editor is probably look at uh, worth looking at giving a second look especially the guy's dialogue because you know for the 60s neck and shoulder as above everything else that was in comic books at that time so that's my endorsement is actually reading some silver age marvel comics wow that's really fat you know what else it'll teach you honestly is uh just efficiency of of story how those characters those they they were continued they weren't pure like anthology style done in ones but the story would just so much would happen in one issue of uh, of an issue of fantastic four or the avengers of the time you well, know enough enough story would happen that nowadays would be covered in like seven issues of the avengers seven issues yeah you know and it like the, the, a lot of people don't remember, but the, in the Galactus saga, they they end that like halfway through the issue, and they still have time to go to Johnny Storm's first first day at college. Like <laughs> you know, like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby really did like pack in a lot into those issues, and I just. I just love them. Like some of my yeah. favorite comic books of all time. You know, I I I really think uh, you know, you know, we 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 you know, Kirby's been gone for decades, but we just lost Steve Ditko as well. We're we're really seeing seeing the end of a uh, of an era when, when now that all these guys are gone. Oh and, yeah, we are. Yeah. And you You're know, talking about, I, You're talking about the greatest generation. You're talking about the World War II veterans. You know, we lost George H. W. Bush. This there's no, the, yeah. There's going to be a lot of these. So it's uh, the the one thing that I would mention is that MST3K is back. I couldn't be more thrilled. I watch anything related to MST3K and all of its many many permutations. So yes, I watch cin- which cinematic Titanic. Yes, I watch all the riff tracks. Uh, yes, I watched the classic MST3K that can be found on Shot Factory, and hell yes, I watched the new series that is on Netflix, and the second season is here, and I've only, you know, I, I don't want to like just binge it all at once, so taking my time with it, but uh, it's, I, I, you know, if you like MST3K, there is now more new parts of it, so, so there you go. Uh, and, and I'll have, um, I think I'm finally going to watch something that Tony has been recommending, but I haven't watched it yet. So I can't tell you whether I endorse it, but I'm pretty sure that I will, which is the blood, th- bloodthirsty trilogy. Tony and I both rushed out to give them our money when it was announced. And I've had it on my shelf now for a number of months and I haven't watched it yet. So I think it's time to watch, uh, the Japanese triple feature of, vampire movies from the 70s the vampire doll lake of dracula and the evil of dracula i mean those are the finest titles i think i've ever heard in my life so so i can't wait that's that's next for me so um cool uh we will be back next week with the black cat guys i'm so happy that you're all back so happy that everybody is healthy and and ready to talk about some amazing lugosi for a number of weeks to come and I hope you have an absolutely wonderful and fulfilling Sunday evening. Well, it's almost over, but <laughs> thanks. Good yes. night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.